I don't have a problem with DSOs. I have a problem with bad private equity deals, and they're very different. So the distinction here that's important, this has nothing to do with DSOs effectively. It has to do with purchase structures and the money behind the buying side. Equally, another critical distinction is the difference between a sale and a buyout. A sale is, of course, I take something from you and I pay you for it. A buyout is where I kind of borrow it. I give you some money and I'm going to basically lease it back from you. There's a big, big difference. And how it manifests in the life of so many well-intentioned gods is going to change their life. And for too many, I'm afraid, as this goes on, that there are many, many people that are walking off the edge of a cliff. Hi, David here. Welcome back to another podcast conversation this week and next week. A great conversation with my good friend and mentor, Mr. Alistair McDonald. If you've listened to this podcast before, you know I bring Alistair back from time to time just to talk about current topics, either in the investing environment, the economic environment, or dentistry specific. And this week and next week, Alistair and I are going to refer to lightly in general to an interview that we were able to pick up, an interview that was out in public uh, regarding the current DSO and private equity in dentistry and where that's come from, where it's going, where it is right now, where it's headed. So we refer to a conversation, we, we don't need to make the parties uh, public, uh, but the conversation brought out some good salient points and we dug into a lot of those this week and next week. So jump in, enjoy this conversation. I'll be back at the back end uh, just to let you know what's gonna happen next week, just a little bit, but I think you'll enjoy this conversation. Take some notes, it's good stuff. What this interview has done is really captured the current zeitgeist. It, it's captured so many of the narratives, uh, so many of the fallacies, so many of the logical fallacies, uh, that, that it really serves as a great summary of where we're at in the collective belief and more dangerously, the collective expectation. I mean, like you, I have so many of these conversations every week. They just show up, they, they tend to be more bite-sized yep. uh, than this. To, to his credit, there were numerous diagnoses that he made that he was bang on right. uh, and, and cautions and concerns and so forth. But talk about great diagnosis, misprescription. Yeah. Uh, it, it's, it's really, it's a, it's a shame. Equally, I appreciated him kind of speaking truth to some of these fraudulent, uh, th that was really great. Yes. But there are still embedded assumptions that are so core to his business model he needs them to be true. Right. Uh, so while he is wide open and clearly able to see the frailties in other business models, he doesn't seem to see the very San Andreas fault that he's built his own house on, you know? Well, this is so commensurate with exactly what we see in the real estate space. Yes. It's, it's, it's that particularly the syndicators that need to keep a pipeline of syndications going because it's transactional on their part. That's where they aggregate acquisition fees, management fees, and, you know, the supposed uh, back-end carry promote, right? And what, what they have to tell themselves is they have to tell themselves the story, the narrative, to rationalize why they keep it going. And, and again, if you have a relevant conversation with a syndicator who really will be authentic with the conversation, they will admit to um, some of the fallacies in in their product, but then they will turn it around. And just the other day, we were talking. I was talking to somebody. Uh, yeah, I remember who it was. And and we were talking about the fact that so many people believe. Well, just wait. The Fed is going to lower interest rates. We're at the peak right now. It's going to come down, and you need to still jump in. And yet, on the other side, they were talking about other other side of the mouth, talking about the fact that. The risk premium for buying rate cap insurance was at an all-time high. Huh. You mean the underwriters who actually price that risk are saying, uh-uh. How do you bring that together? It's like, hmm, that, yeah, I guess I guess not. <laughs> so, yeah. But they yeah. have to tell themselves the narrative, right? To, to Because they've got a, an incentive because their business is based on a certain model that's worked over the last decade plus. It's probably worth, I think, what, what's lost here, so much that's lost, but this is, these are investment decisions. And historically speaking, docs and engineers are the worst investors. Uh, they just are because they come from this world of kind of physics and we're dealing with the world of biology, which is human herding instincts, mimetic desire, etc. This is not at all a pneumatic system where you push down here and that comes up. 
And I say that because by way of qualification, I mean, I first stepped professionally into the investing world, I can't believe it, uh, 20, uh, 24 years ago. You, you've got even greater tenure than that. I mean, what are we talking about in collect? Because these are investment decisions that are being made here. They've got nothing to do with dentistry. Right. So true. So true. I mean, how many, how many years have you been at it? Well, this is 1980. That's four decades plus. So we're talking about a cumulative 65 years between us of, of diverse investment experience. And this is the key piece. We are, of course, living in a siloed world, and we're sure this is about dentistry. No, this is these are investment decisions. Also, we've had the privilege of having numerous conversations, particularly over the last three years, regarding the cycles, the business cycles. In fact, I would say we're even in a longer secular cycle change, and yet we still see the markets in general uh, very exuberant, very exuberant, quite irrational. People feeling like that. Things will return to a, a normalized period of time once we get through this recession and the higher interest rates, and we'll all go back to this feeding frenzy that seems to push all assets up, 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 up. And in particular, we both have the privilege of dealing with and helping people in the in industry of, of dentistry. Not unlike almost any other industry, the dentistry profession uh, is, is a business, and when people are talking about the opportunity in front of them to take the chips off the table, that is to sell the practice, part of the practice, which another term for that with many of the quote sales today would be a buyout. We'll get into some of that in a moment. But looking at that as an opportunity and feeling this frenzy, the, the FOMO that we see so many times in the marketplace, you said recently that this is not about dentistry. This is about investment decisions in which most of our brethren and colleagues that are very, very astute in their clinical expertise, and many are quite good in their businesses, don't really understand the crux moves that they're looking at when they're considering making a move to sell part or all of a practice, particularly so many at a young age today. I'll stop there. We Well, I'll say this too. We, we also listen to different people with, at seminars, events, podcasts, interviews, and again, this conversation comes up over and over again, and we see that so many times the nuances or the stories, the narratives that many who are on the side of being incentivized to see these sales or buyouts go through have to tell themselves a story about why this is a good thing, even though they could probably they can probably diagnose exactly the pros and cons of the trade that's being made. So accurate as a setup out of the gates i think it's worth pointing out there is as there always is this we're betrayed by the language that we use and uh, to that end we can be betrayed by our own misuse of the wrong of, of terms and there's a lot of that going on and there always is with new magical phenomena uh, there's a lot of them one example uh, and i think a critical distinction is I don't have a problem with DSOs. I have a problem with bad private equity deals, and they're very different. Uh, what is old uh, is private equity. What is new to dentistry is private equity. Whether they're coming in through a DSO or use any sort of acronym you like, I've seen equivalent deals in the veterinary space, the, the PT, et cetera, et cetera. So the distinction here that's important, this has nothing to do with DSOs effectively. It has to do with purchase structures and the money behind the buying side. Uh, equally, another critical distinction is the difference between a sale and a buyout. Uh, a sale is, of course, I take something from you and I pay you for it. A buyout is where I kind of borrow it. I give you some money and I'm going to basically lease it back from you. There's a big, big difference. And how it manifests in the life of so many well-intended, well-intentioning dogs is going to change their life. And for too many, I'm afraid, as this goes on and as the hyperbole begins to escalate even more than it did a year ago, I am now officially concerned that there are many, many people that are walking off the edge of a cliff. Uh, of the quality of life that they have and the value of the assets that they think they're getting a good deal on. Uh, so the, the language is crucial. 
It's no different than renting a home versus buying a home. It's quite literally that larger gap between a buyout and a sale. Equally, a sale that suddenly as we get through the LOI and the uh, quality of earnings assessments and so forth, we suddenly go from language of purchase to partner. The slight, slight of hand is the stuff every magician uses. Look at this, look at this. Now, boom, we've got something else. There's so many of these, uh, but I'm sure we'll get into it. So what we're really talking about is that term that many of us who are, have not been in the financial markets, we've heard it over and over again, the leveraged buyout. The exactly. leveraged buyout. Uh, Carl Icahn, who, who thought that we in the industry could, could participate in Icon space, right? But that's what we were talking about here, a leveraged buyout, as you said, leveraging the equity that a hardworking doc has built up in his or her practice, the private equity DSO leveraging that uh, on the buyout and leaving that buyout to whatever the market's going to bring, and that's where that's where the trouble begins, is it not? Because we can look back with recency bias as what we've seen in the last five or six years, perhaps uh, maybe even even not so much in the last couple of years, but there are those who would still sing the song that it's all good, it's all good. But what we've seen is not necessarily going to be what what portends in the future. My my experience has been in the real estate sector, but it's no different. Real estate, typically, traditionally, particularly with the low interest rates, the, the hot, cheap money that we've had coming out of the 2008 great financial crisis has allowed for assets and leverage to be used to the max, way past the max. And so I see the same thing in real estate where we've had in the last decade, particularly the last greater portion of this last decade, the, the quick turn. You just acquire an asset, maybe put a little lipstick on it, and you turn it uh, to a seller who will pay a higher price because, again, the cost of capital is so cheap. Who can lose? Who can lose? So, so this goes over and over and over again. I know right now in the real estate space, there are, there are big problems and big headwinds that we see right now. Why aren't we seeing that? Or are we seeing that? Maybe I should ask that better question. Uh, are we seeing that, but it's just not being publicized as much uh, through the narratives in the DSO dental space today. The can's being kicked down the road uh, between three to five years from now, depending on when individuals bought. As a function of interest rates, which everybody is sure has nothing to do with dentistry, uh, it has everything to do with anything that money touches. Interest rates are reflective, of course, of risk premium. So we've seen a significant rise in the pricing of risk uh, ever since the July 2020 lows in the long-term bond. We are uh, now entering a secular upswing in interest rates. And for those that are not clear, the larger trend has turned from uh, down to up. This means money is going to get more expensive. How can we say we're in a larger secular upswing in interest rates? We will remain in a new upswing in interest rates until and unless new lows are made. And this is a simple distinction and used in the financial markets. Uh, we consider ourselves in a bull market. Uh, provided that we continue to break new highs and we're in a bear market uh, to the extent that we're making new lows, which is really not so much bull and bear as it is uh, a rising or a falling market. There's a, there's a slight distinction there too. So we can, with confidence, continue to act as if the larger trend has turned up, and we should. Anybody that is not paying attention to that is selling you a model that worked with falling interest rates, which right now, unfortunately, is about 98% of business owners uh, and in particular uh, in, in professional investors who are on the other side of the trade. You're absolutely right on. This is a leveraged buyout 2.0. Actually, it's, it's really 3.0. It's less about, and anybody who cites performance in dentistry in the last three years is uh, if anyone is advising you and using data of the last five years in dentistry, they are misinformed, to be kind. What they would do better off doing is going back and studying the LBO boom of the 1980s, how it began, what spawned it, what the ERISA, uh, ERISA Act did, the failure of the, of the 1977 uh, Carter tax plan that caused a spike of capital to move into the space and created what we now know as the modern day leveraged buyout two types of private equity firms. There are venture capital and leveraged buyout. These really began in the 1940s, but they didn't hit their stride until uh, the late 1970s and the changes in taxation code 
by Reagan in 1981, which spawned these icons, as we know of, uh, that are now still, they're still prominent. You mentioned Coral Icon is a perfect example. The irony is that uh, because of the nature of how they went about the business that they were in, they were re referred to as corporate raiders in the 1980s. You, you know this, I, I know this. But today, they're activist investors. I mean, what a beautiful whitewashing of an actual track record that destroyed far more businesses than it ever built. Right. It just does. Docs would do well to understand how it is that private equity makes their money. There's many, many different things about them, uh, as well as, of course, the sense of privilege, which I hope we can come to. The the key piece is Warren Buffett, to, for, to, to a large extent, in 1963-65 was essentially running a private equity fund. It's changed dramatically over the years. And in that he bought Berkshire Hathaway, a failing uh, textile company, and realized that he could borrow against these assets to buy other more profitable businesses, such that Berkshire Hathaway became this dregs, the dregs on the balance sheet of Berkshire Hathaway. Over time, he continued to use that leverage to acquire high cash flow businesses. The difference is where he diverged from most private equity groups is that he did not use excessive leverage and he actually cared about ongoing relationships with those businesses he bought. What has this got to do with us? There are today a very, very different profile. The, these industries represent a very different profile than the standard self-titled conservative doc follows. While Warren Buffett and those of us that actually own businesses are playing the long game, Warren Buffett, as an example, he's no longer the leverage buyout guy, and he really wasn't very much, uh, though his seeds were in there. Warren Buffett focuses on time. Private equity focuses on speed. If they're less concerned about the size, as concerned about the speed of the turn as they are the return they get. The antithesis of Warren Buffett. Yeah. So to call them professional investors is a misnomer. They are professional speculators. And they have developed a masterful blueprint to do it with other people's money. Worked beautifully for them in the 80s. Many businesses were destroyed. This is the nature of the beast. It's worth remembering that in every transaction, there's a buyer and a seller. The buyer believes that this asset could be sold in the future for a greater value, or it's going to spin off cash flow that suggests that. The seller believes that this price is as good as it's going to get. Only one of them will be right. The grand irony of most private equity DSO sales today is docs actually think they can have it both ways. They actually think that they can be both a seller and a buyer simultaneously, which is to say, I will sell you X percent of my practice clearly at an egregiously overpriced valuation, or I wouldn't sell it, but I will stick around with some retained, quote unquote, retained equity. In a business I have never seen the balance sheet of, with investors whose performance will never be known to me, roll 40% of my family's net worth into the hands of professional speculators. Again, whose balance sheet I haven't seen, whose returns I cannot know, whose track record and system is unknown to me. We're going to do this, and we're going to ride it out into the future. You cannot be a buyer and a seller simultaneously. You have to pick a team. So individuals are doing this with no sense at all of where the money is actually going back to. It's critical that we realize if this money is so sophisticated, it's going to go home. It's going to go home. Where is this yield going to come from? We ought to talk about growth and where this is all going to come from. So many misunderstandings here. But there's one piece here, and I'll stop on this point, though there's a lot more to it, is when when I say that I'm going, so I'm going to partner with you. I'll, oh, we'll get this beautiful multiple. No, we won't. We will be shown a high figure. I want to speak about this if we can. I'll be shown a higher figure, receive 60% of it. And that 40% will be an ongoing investment in this parent company. Out of the gates, we've got a problem. I'm agreeing to sell to you because you're overpaying me. I wouldn't sell otherwise. I'm not going to sell you a dollar for 50 cents. I clearly believe that you're paying me $2 for a $1 bill, meaning that you have already shown a track record of overpaying for investments. If there's one thing that you teach all of uh, the members of Freedom Founders that you and I are actively pointing to, the surest way 
to get a great return is to pay less on the front end. The surest way to get a really bad return is to overpay. So out of the gates, docs are choosing to go all in with their family asset, with an, uh, with an outfit that is known by 100% of their track record for overpaying for practices. And you're going to invest the rest of your capital with them. This, this is why I say you can't be a seller and a buyer simultaneously. Okay, that's a wrap for this week. As I said, we'll have a follow-up. This conversation will continue next week with Alistair McDonald, and we'll go back to the origins of where some of the hot money has transversed across different economic arenas, even internationally, before it came back and started finding housing in 2008, and then into the dental industry specifically in 2013 to 2018, and where it's moving now. The fact is the money always moves the environment today, the higher interest rates, is making a big, big difference. So jump in next week and we'll give you a little bit more of the overview of how all this money works.